but uh okay okay yeah. uh so should i restart or <laughs> i mean you don't have to literally restart i think but you can just carry on like you can just uh state the okay. title and just pick up from where you okay where you are. Yeah. uh so i was saying you have to be patient for the the fact that i've been uh leaving behind this stuff for a few years so some corners of what i'm telling you today are still quite sharp because this has been a work in progress somehow it's it revealed to be a very difficult problem in in a sense and uh, uh, i was working on this quite relentlessly but i have made very little progress through time uh, and then i completely stopped because i started doing different things. This is a talk about width and not much about depth, because what I would like to convey is why it should be uh, important. It would be very meaningful to find an answer to the question I asked myself years ago. And uh, I will more or less conclude the talk by just saying, we could go this path, we could, could work this way, but uh, I have no idea how to actually prove the theorem. So be patient. Okay, let me start with a little bit, let me start with the mathematics and let me start with a little bit of history, I would say. So I have to explain to you what I mean by the category theory of derivatives. So you all know how derivative theory was, was born. It was uh, one of the many good ideas by Alexander Grothendieck who uh, devised this theory in response to the many shortcomings of the theory of triangulated categories that was uh, put forward by Verdier, if I remember well, um, to study algebraic geometry and the construction in algebraic geometry in a very in a, in a categorical way with category theoretic meanings. And uh, well, he, the, the theory of triangulated categories is quite ill-behaved from the point of view of the pure category theory, even though the language itself proved to be extremely useful and, and, uh, and uh, powerful to describe problems in geometry and then in representation theory and uh, a plethora of applications. This uh, is an extract from a paper by Malsignotis who says that uh, despite uh, the, uh, the fact that triangulated categories are so useful for a category theorist, uh, they are kind of an ill-behaved uh, object, an ill-behaved gadget, because, for example, the correspondence that uh, associates to, let's say, uh, an abelian category, or let's say, to be even more concrete, to a ring, it's derived category. If you take the, the derived category just as a triangulated category, you cannot really characterize it as a universal object. So. There is no really universal property that this gadget satisfies, even though it's so useful. And this has been as uh, like started many, uh, many, many meditations on the concept of derived category of triangulated category. And now there is a plethora of different approaches with which you can try to correct this problem and do really categorical stable homotopy theory of triangulated category. Derivator theory is one of these concepts. So Grothendieck proposed this very simple and, and uh, smart idea to study not only the derived category of a given abelian category, but the whole class of derived categories of categories of functors of shape J, where J is any small category. J runs over the, the, the two category of small categories. The correspondence that associates j to this derived category to a, of a to the j is a contravariant to functor. And uh, this is the, the, the typical kind of objects that in derivatives theory one wants to study. So the idea is simple. It works as is um, customary with Grothenic. And uh, this is in fact a very better behaved object and the prototype of the kind of structure we want to study. The idea can also be motivated by a very geometrically, geometrically minded uh, intuition because uh, a generic functor of this shape, a this should be a contravariant functor, of course, 
from small categories to possibly large categories is uh, the model of what we want to study, the, a, a pre-derivator. And the derivator will be such a functor on top of which we uh, impose additional exactness properties, which resemble in a way the shift conditions or the stack condition. And this analogy is meaningful in a, in a very precise sense. Good, so since then, many people rediscovered this notion. For example, Keller independently arrived to basically the same notion of derivator that Grothendieck gave. And, uh, but uh, a special mention goes to Moritz Groth, who very recently refurbished the entire building of the theory that Grothendieck uh, laid down and clarified many aspects of the theory, offering a lot of insights and applications to stable homotopy theory, algebra, geometry, also clarifying how triangulated categories arise, because uh, if in this definition, J is the terminal category, I can recover the derived category of A, but I also have a lot of, of different structure. Good, so uh, Moritz also has a series of paper on the representation theory of quivers and uh, how you can use homotopy theory to uh, understand some very deep theorems about uh, the combinatorics of the representation theory of categories of quivers. So this tool is a very, powerful gadget to classify and to solve actual problems in mathematics, in important mathematics. But I believe that now time is ripe to break free from the chains of geometry. Uh, I, I really like this quote from a, a, a book on cobordism theory. Unfortunately, I don't remember the, the, the title that says, from now we shall use no geometry. And the book is on actual Cobordism theory. I, I, I always found this very funny. Uh, anyway, to be slightly more modest, uh, I believe time is ripe and there is meaning in studying derivators by means of true category theory. By true, I mean two-dimensional. And by the reason why I want the, this category theory to be two-dimensional is pretty clear because the objects that we study are inherently two-dimensional. They are pseudo functors and th there is a two category of this thing. This is very natural because uh, also because uh, as I mentioned before, a derivator is just a certain kind of two functor on top of which I impose exactness properties. And again, the analogy with the shift conditions is uh, meaningful because there is a theory of two dimensional sheaves uh, laid down, uh, if I remember well, in the eighties by, by Ross Street as many others theorems in two categories. Um, yeah, so if you know what is a stack, well, if you know what is a pre-sheaf and a sheaf, and what is the relation between the two, you know that there is a, an adjunction that sheafifies a given pre-sheaf, so imposes the sheaf conditions, you know that this can be uh, translated in the word of two categories, because you have pre-stacks and you can stackify a pre-stack. Many people are interested for very concrete and, and super important reasons in extending these to infinity categories. So they have infinity pre-stacks, whatever they are, whatever model you choose. And there is also a process of infinity stackification. We will basically sit in the middle because our objects are inherently two-dimensional, but uh, the philosophy is exactly the same. And this is another extremely powerful idea by Grothendieck that you want to study well-behaved functors in order to uh, understand better the, the geometry of your problems. Good, so despite how natural this idea is, uh, the two category theory of derivators uh, is more or less absent from the current state of the art. By two-dimensional category theory, I mean uh, loosely what's usually called two-dimensional algebra. The theory, for example, of Khan extensions, the theory of uh, um, um, weakenings of the notion of limit and colimit, for example, pseudo-limits, bilimits, lax limits, oplax limits, and all that sort of zoo. The theory of two monads, the theory of pseudo-monads and pseudo-algebras for two monads, et cetera, et cetera. 
In short, I mean all the mathematics for which the Australian school of category theory is famous. So the question that animates this talk is the following. What is Australian derivative theory? How can I put the extreme, the, the huge amount of mathematics that uh, the, the, the school of Sydney wrote down to understand the theory, the algebra of two categories, to understand better and to give a, a, a more, um, a, a clearer foundation for the theory of derivatives. So I devoted quite a lot of work in trying to answer this question. My prior work offers a partial answer to this question. I have a couple of papers on, on derivative theory uh, and I was more or less animated by the fact that I started my PhD working with uh, another model for stable homotopy, which is way more flexible, way more famous, and has even more nice application, which is the language of stable infinity categories. So this is more or less the, the, the gist of my PhD thesis. I was able to characterize these structures as factorization systems on stable infinity categories. So when my PhD ended, and the, the, the main application was to the theory of bridge and stability conditions and uh, the, the, the basic theory of these structures and the theory of perverse sheaves and all that sort of things that I liked quite a lot at, at the time. So I was motivated by this and by the uh, will to find the analog for this theorem that characterizes these structures as suitable categorical gadgets in the uh, language of derivatives. This is basically uh, the, the, the content of a paper I have on derivative factorization systems with Simone Virilli that came out in the Journal of Algebra a few years ago already. And it's basically reworking the, the, main, theory of, the main theorem of my PhD into another language. So more or less an exercise in style, but it shed it raised a, a, a lot of questions on, on how derivative theory behaves. And essentially it motivated me looking for a better understanding of the foundations of derivative theory. Good, I, I don't want to enter in the, in the bare technicalities because I think it's quite boring to lay down all the foundation for what we needed, but more or less we were able to prove that uh, a factorization system on the derivative is encoded into a genuinely two categorical gadget. A certain two monad uh, prescribes uh, via the construction of algebras what it means for a derivative to possess a factorization system. And we basically copied a similar theorem that existed for the two category of categories. We made it uh, valid for a category of stacks, pre-stacks slash stacks. Okay, this motivated me to study the theory of localizations. And uh, again, with, uh, with Simone, uh, Simone Virilli, we were able to lay down the, the theory of uh, what it means for a derivative to be a reflective subcategory slash derivative of a given one. There is a very neat theorem in category theory that says that reflective uh, uh, localizations are in bijection with uh, idempotent monads and with cer a certain class of uh, factorization systems on the category where you study localizations, of which you study localizations. And this again holds in the two category of derivatives by copying a proof in capped that is given in terms of, uh, uh, let's say via abstract, an, an abstract way of reasoning. So at some point I wondered, well, how much two category theory can I, can I uh, perform? Can I, can I write down valid in the two category of derivatives? It's a reasonable question. So my claim is that uh, the category theory that is valid in CAPT is, it is possible to export it to the category theory of derivatives pre-derivators first, and then specialize it to derivators, actually. But you have to make precise what it means, the category theory. What is the category theory? So, uh, yeah, no one had this question before, as 
as far as I could know by, by uh, searching everywhere in the literature how to, to address this, this question. Uh, this also motivated me to question myself on what is the category theory I was learning and how can we export it to, to different settings. And to, it also motivated me to uh, question myself in other fields, but I will answer only, I will try to answer only the first question now. Uh, okay, so what is category theory? This is actually, I'm not the first to, to invent these ideas. This is actually a question on which category theorists reflected for a very long time. And uh, well, we have two categories and uh, uh, basically we invented category theory to abstract in a certain way, in a certain naive way, we could say that we invented category theory in order to abstract uh, the, the behavior of the collection of all sets and all functions to be able to speak about uh, not only sets, but structures, mathematical structures and the functions that preserve that structure. So we can do basically the same with uh, uh, a two category. So let's fix a two category and let's declare that the category theory of K is the ability to compute inside the, the two category to, to speak about and to compute with inside the category K, the structure that is given, namely the zero, one and two cells of the category, the fact that certain cells have universal properties, the fact that I can build, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, strict pseudo and lax limits of all kind, the fact that I can consider can extensions, the fact that I can study monads internal to the two category K and algebras for those monads. So this should be the category theory. But again, this is not a precise definition. So can we do better than this? Well, yes. And uh, every time I present this material, I find no better way than to quote directly from a very beautiful book by John Gray, whose title is Formal Category Theory. The first few sentences are the following. The purpose of category theory is to try to describe certain general aspects of mathematics. And since category theory is also part of mathematics, this categorical type of description should apply to it as well as to other parts of mathematics. And also the basic idea is that the category of small categories, cat, is a two category with properties. One should then attempt to identify those properties that enable one to do the structural part of category theory. So in the same way in category theory, in plain one category theory, you treat your objects and you look, them, you look at them externally without touching their elements. Now you would like to study objects as if they were two categories, but without looking inside them and characterize, for example, characterizing the property of a category to have, uh, to possess a, a terminal object in a purely diagrammatic way. This can be done because you rephrase the definition into the existence of a certain adjunction. So you don't let, have to look into the category, but if that condition is true, you know that uh, the category must have a, a terminal object. So, Let's dive into formal category theory now. If you are a bit of a logician, if you met a bit of categorical logic, you probably are familiar with uh, the fact that uh, category theory is a theory, loosely speaking. Theories can be interpreted, theories have model, and uh, we are basically after an abstract theory for the theory of categories when by theory, I just mean theory in a technical sense. So the first take from Gray's book see, can, can be seen as the idea that category theory is a theory that we can interpret in different contexts. And these contexts are two categories. And the more we ask to the two categories, the more powerful is the internal language to use a term that comes from categorical logic that we can find inside these categories. The second take instead is essentially saying that uh, 
this task, the, the first task, is meant to unravel the properties that enable us to treat an abstract two category K as if we were working with CAT. This is not a new idea and it's a very powerful idea because topless theory, for example, is uh, built on the idea that you want to treat a category as if it were the category of sets because toposes are exactly the categories that connect, contain enough structure to encode the language of set theory. But also categorical algebra is based on a similar idea because you want to outline the properties that uh, make a category behave like if it were the, the category of models of an algebraic theory, for example, the category of groups. You might have met uh, the, uh, the, the notion of functorial semantics. This is exactly what, what I'm talking about. Homological algebra and, in a sense, stable homotopy are also built on this idea. Because in homological algebra, you would like to study categories that, in a, in a certain precise sense, behave like if they were the categories of chain complexes. And the notion of quill and model category, again, is uh, uh, based on the same idea. So, very natural. Surprisingly, though, the bare structure of a two category with nothing much, nothing more on top, does not suffice to embody all category theory in a formal way. You can do a lot. And the, the reason is, well, rooted in the fact that three categories exist and uh, there are purely three, three dimensional phenomena happening in two categories, but it's not worth to, to dive into this very technical detour. You can do a lot though, because you can speak of adjunctions in a generic two category. You can speak of monads, you can define kind of extensions, but you cannot always compute them in a, in a reasonably concrete way. You can describe what are vibrations. So you see, you can do a lot, but you also miss a lot. For example, as I said before, you miss, uh, uh, in a generic two category, you lack a, a, a formula that allows you to compute can extensions as if they were colimits. You also lack uh, other descriptions of adjunctions because these ohm set like isomorphism doesn't make sense in a, in a generic two category because what are these objects in the two category K, in an abstract two category? More importantly, you miss the Yoné dilemma. So in my view, you miss all category theory if you miss Yoné dilemma. You also lack a, a meaningful way to study profunctors. You might have seen them called bimodules, but the, the name the profunctor and bimodule define the same concept. So the idea is to find properties of a two category where I can do either the Yoné dilemma, or I can find back the theory of profunctors. In a suitable sense, if you find one framework, you have a lot to do also the other, but that's not the place to, to deepen this, this idea. Um, so if you take the first Y item seriously, well, you have to cope with the idea that category theory has to be the class of consequences of the unit dilemma. In a sense, this is true. If you ask me, I would say this is true. So a Yoneda structure is what's enough to find the Yoneda dilemma in K, because you have to specify a bunch of structure on, on, on K. Every small object in a suitable sense must have a map that behaves like the Yoneda embedding. P of A plays the role of the category of pre shields on A, of course. And then you start asking axioms. I will not recall them. I will not describe them in depth, but you can always uh, ask questions later that uh, ensure that these maps really behave like if they were Yonet embeddings. One property, for example, that you would like to, to encode is that PA acts as the, the free completion of A under colimits. So whatever this PA is, it must be co-complete with respect to all diagrams that live in the two category K. And all this property and many others that form the axiomatics are meant to describe this diagrammatically. By diagrammatic, diagrammatically, of course, I mean by 
two-dimensional universal properties. For example, these two cell feels a triangle for every F and the Yoneda embedding of A. These two cell must have both the uh, universal property of a certain colimit and of another colimit. I will not enter into the real definition. Okay, good. So if instead you take seriously the second proposal, well, category theory, you have to look at category theory as in a sense, the theory, a theory of generalized monoids. You all know that a monoid is just a category with a single object. Well, monoids are also well known for having this irresistible tendency to act on objects. It's very important to study actions of monoids and groups. It's also very important to study actions of categories. How do you call the action of a category on, on a family of sets? Well, you call them a pre sheets or co pre sheets And profunctors are exactly categories acting on both sides on a family of sets. So the notion of CD by module or profunctor for short leads is rooted on this idea that categories are monoids and they act on objects because a profunctor from C to D is exactly a functor from C op times D to set. There is a two, two category, actually a bi-category of, of uh, these structures. And uh, uh, there is an embedding of the two category of categories into this bi-category that essentially regards every category and functor between two categories as uh, uh, a certain very special kind of bimodule that is induced by, uh, the, the, um, by the natural action of a functor. You call stuff in the image of this map P a representable profunctor or a representable bimodule. Cool, so far so good. So now, uh, well, yeah, you can prove a lot of things after these um, definitions. For example, you can prove that the construction that associates in a Yoneda structure, the construction that associates to A its pre-sheaves, its P of A is actually a pseudo functor. It follows from the axioms that you give. You can endow P with the structure of monad. You can do a lot of things. And in this paper that I wrote with Ivan de Liberti, we were focusing on relating these two frameworks because we were able to prove that there is actually a relation between the other structures and uh, the other structure that this kind of well-behaved embeddings of a two category, in this case, cut uh, into a bi-category that behaves like if it was the, the by category of bimodules. You call this map P a pro arrow equipment, or you say that K bar equips K with pro arrows. So there is a relation between these two frameworks that in our opinion was quite neglected in the literature. No one cared about finding it. And uh, yeah, it's this paper on the unicity of formal category theories. Good. So. Uh, let's cut it a little bit shorter because I think I'm using so much time with just the category theory. Why am I interested in this kind of stuff? Well, because I would like to find a Yoneda structure on the two category of pre-derivators. Good. So um, my claim, a little bit pretentious at the moment because I don't have a proof for this claim is that the category theory we know about derivators is true because there is a Yoneda structure on that category. It's not by chance that you can speak about monads and they are well behaved. You can speak about uh, factorization systems and they are quite well behaved. You can speak about localizations and there is a bijection between these three things. You can also the, there is a paper by, by Moritz Groth that lays down a little bit of foundation for what a um, uh, by module in the two category of pre-derivators and derivators should be. There is also a paper that 
explores the notion of vibration in the two category of, uh, of derivators. So these things do not happen by chance. And uh, my claim is that they happen because there is a, enough structure in the two category of derivators that allows for uh, the existence of these things. Also, I, I, I am interested in foundation, but I also believe that this could uh, help unravel more applications for derivators. For example, it, it is possible in a category with a unit structure to describe uh, what is a locally presentable and accessible object. And when you have those notions in a two category, you can easily access to many useful forms of a joint functor theorem. I had many conversations with Moritz at the time when he was um, motivated in finding an adjoint functor theorem for derivators. Because let's say you work in algebraic geometry or in algebraic topology, how many times you would love to know that a given functor has a left or a right adjoint and you can activate the powerful machinery of, uh, of Freud's theorems that say that if such and such conditions are true, then this functor must have an adjoint. Another possible application generalizes what Moritz did in this paper about bimodules. The, the application for that paper, I don't remember the exact title. It was a very long title, but I remember it, it, it had applications to representation theory of quivers in mind. Um, and they needed uh, bits of the theory of bimodules. I believe you can do it more deeply. You can do it in a more formal way. You can po probably recover all the uh, applications that they find, all the uses, uses that they find. It's probably a good idea with a Yoneda structure to polish and to give a, a better presentation for the theory of vibrations. There is a paper or two by Fritz Orman on the notion of a, what is a fibered derivator and a fibered multi-derivator with the very enticing, with the very alluring idea to find a, a, a formal, a, an extremely conceptual framework to phrase uh, uh, the, the, um, all the, the super complex isomorphisms that you find in Conrad's book of, about the, the six-functor formalism. So he was motivated by finding a conceptual framework for this. I believe that that theory can be put in the right foundational conceptual framework if we find a Yoneda structure on derivators, more or less because it's possible to define vibrations in a generic two category, but they are very well behaved and they mimic the classical theory in a two category with a Yoneda structure. And many others, possibly many others ideas can be found if we actually manage to find a Yoneda structure. But uh, as simple and practical and sensible uh, this proposal might seem, uh, this is a screenshot from uh, my paper with uh, Ivan de Liberti, uh, you, you encounter, you, soon after, you encounter so many technical problems. So I, I didn't find any better way than to screenshot the paper because here is where we explain what's going on. Cross Street found a way to endow every category of pre-stacks with a Yoneda structure that he dubs the variable Yoneda structure. The idea is pretty simple. You have a Yoneda structure on cat because that's your toy example. And then you want a Yoneda structure on a category of pre-stacks over cat. Well, the, the Yoneda structure in cat is just the example where the, the domain of the category of pre-stacks is the point. And so you rephrase all the axioms in a fiber-wise way, let's say. But this Yoneda structure has the, the disadvantage of being extremely rooted in set theory. You have to make uh, ugly choices of foundation. You have to fix a hierarchy of universes. You have to do all that crap that you have to do when you have to cope with the different size of category. But this is not a problem because uh, no one cares about foundations. The real problem is that this Yoneda structure forgets completely 
the fact that the intuition that I want to have on a derivator is that the pieces that form the derivator, this category is D of I, as I runs over small categories, are ca homotopy categories of things, of the things I want to classify, of the things I want to study. So the categories I want to study are always homotopy, complete and co-complete. But Yoneda structures involve the process of discreetly completing an object, this, uh, adding co-limits that are not homotopy co-limits. So in a sense, the skewness between co-limits and homotopy co-limits, the fact that you can have, homotopically speaking, you can have a category that uh, um, has all homotopy co-limits, but lacks even co-equalizers. So a very bad from a very bad object from the one dimensional point of view. And this skewness, in a sense, gets in the way and prevents you from finding the structure you would, you would, uh, you would want. The, the naive idea would be to study these correspondences of this kind that to a given category associate the homotopy category of uh, uh, simplicial diagrams shaped on J. This is certainly a natural proposal, but at this point, you, 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 you hit with your face with, on, on this problem that uh, these categories are by no means co-complete in the classical sense, in the set theoretic sense. So you have to rework, you have to, to fiddle a little bit with the street definition of a Yoneda structure in order to put homotopy theory in it. And this proved to be extremely difficult technically on the technical level. So is this the story of a failure? Well, I have ideas I can put forward because I think this is the best idea we got studying and thinking about this problem. Um, all in all, the structure you, you would like to, to construct is a, a certain kind of well-behaved two monad. For size reasons, this cannot really be a monad. Uh, uh, it should be called a relative monad, but uh, I won't enter into details. And instead, I would ask you to look at this, at the following diagram. So uh, the, the, the vertical arrow is just Yoneda embedding with an opposite put there for technical, boring technical reasons. This nu is the functor that sends a small category to the nerve of the pre-shift category. So you first do the free co-completion as you would do it in classical one category theory. And then you take the nerve that translates in the correct way your pre-shift category in the infinity categorical world or in whatever higher categorical world you, you might like. The other functor now associates uh, uh, the takes the, the derivator that you get from this association because you take uh, uh, a given category to the pseudo functor that sends J to the homotopy category of A to the nerve of J. Does this work? I don't know because uh, I didn't manage to finish proving this, the, the, the theorem that the functor you obtain from pre-derivators to derivators actually behaves in the way we want. And uh, from my paper with, uh, with Ivan de Liberti, well, the axioms that you have to verify are the following. P is a relative, as I said, pseudomonad. And every one cell in its domain acquires a, a, a left joint in the codomain. So is this true? I don't know. Let's find out. Does this work? It should be that the usual test benches are find computations within the categories of stable derivators. Algebraic derivators are even a simpler, uh, an even simpler framework for uh, stable homotopy for derived categories because algebraic derivators arise as homotopy categories of categories of modules. So your, your um, object of study is a 
plain ring, not an homotopy ring, uh, not uh, a spectrum, nothing of that sort. Let's start from, from baby steps and then extend to all the derivators later. I'm not sure this can be done because uh, one big problem that I have kept hidden under the carpet is that uh, uh, usually when you work with derivators, things work way better if you study stable derivators because of a technical reason that is rooted in uh, the fact that stably, in stable homotopy, you have Brown representability and unstably, you just don't. Once you address all these problems, some of them could be impossible to address, possible, it's even likely. Uh, the next step is to find analogs for a joint factor theorems that you have can extensions, bimodules, and all sorts of stuff. So, and then we search for applications. Easy, easier said than done. So this is where my talk ends. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, I wanted to make a meme at the end of the talk at all costs, and uh, I did it. <laughs> I'm sorry I have to end the talk with uh, uh, questions more than answers, but uh, this is a, an open-ended project. I hope you liked uh, the ideas and I really hope you can find something useful in them if you want to take the, the witness and go on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fosco, for, for your wonderful presentation. Can we all unmute ourselves now and uh, give Fosco a round of applause? Okay, uh, do we have any questions for Foster? If you have a question, just unmute yourself and speak, or of course you can put your question in the chat. I cannot see the chat, uh, maybe. Oh yeah, now I see it. I see that Jan Kolev wrote in the chat. Uh, he is one guy that I forgot to acknowledge for a very insightful paper. So sorry, Jan. We never met in person, but I'm calling you Jan. You probably know some things I talked about way better than me. <laughs> yeah, what I, something also maybe to mention is uh, there is this work from 2016 of um, one of my, my academic siblings, Giannis Lagas, who started poking at the monad theory. Yes. It's, a little bit, it's a little bit fishy. Mostly he was trying to mimic something that our advisor did in, uh, in triangulated category theory, very verbatim. Um, I read that paper, yeah. I'll link that in the chat for anyone who's interested. But that was a, that was a, a poke into the monad theory, but not from this perspective that you're describing. Well, yeah, the, there were a few good ideas in the paper. I remember it pretty well. Uh, when I needed some basic facts on monads, I took a different path, mostly because somewhere, somewhat, the notation was somewhat uh, uh, not exactly inviting, if I remember well. But uh, it, it was a good paper, yeah. And that's definitely related to all I talked about. So yes, thanks for mentioning it. Yeah, I think uh, I've seen uh, Jonas's name or picture on Paul Baumer's page because, yeah, Ian, you were Paul Baumer's PhD student, right? Yeah. That's but right. I, yeah, but I don't think I've ever, yeah, maybe I should invite him for a talk. You should not invite Jonas because he works in finance now. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thanks for the. Thanks for the heads up. Yeah, there have been multiple occasions where I've emailed someone and they have said, well, I think Gabriel Valenzuela was the most recent occurrence. Like I emailed someone for a talk or asked them to come to a meeting and they say, well, I'm not in academia anymore. Um, can I make a couple of comments? Sure. Please, go on. So I wanted to say that when we were thinking, so I'm one of the co-authors that has been mentioned a couple of times. 
um, when we were thinking about how to build the um, how to build this UNEDA structure, and we we proposed one UNEDA structure. I mean, that UNEDA structure actually might work. We were stuck because we are not experts in the theory of Quillen function adjunctions in general, and yes. like this model categories topic, and so we didn't know whether actually one could one could get to the point. Uh, I honestly believe that if someone is expert enough with the theory of Quillen adjunctions, the statement is true. Like the um, UNEDA structure that we propose does work. That's my expectation, to be honest. Um, so it was more a problem of our lack of knowledge, in a sense, in my opinion, yes. more than anything else. And I think a concrete computation might actually work better than the last idea that, that Fosco suggested, which is more, a more general approach in a sense. Yes, uh, I was, um, the last time I tried with all my energies to work on this was when I was invited in Murcia by Simone Virili. The people there, were definitely experts, I would say, in the theory of derived categories of rings. And we tried for a few days to find uh, a way out of the, of the problem. But uh, we came up with this idea, with this simple way to state what we need later than, than that moment. So it can be. And definitely the, the, the main problem is that we were young at the time. I was young, Ivan was younger, so. That's also why I cared about presenting this idea finally to expert people, because I also believe that with a little bit of effort, this is a theorem. I also believe it's true. Okay. And then I also wanted to mention that in order to make it work until the very end, probably one needs the, the theory of Chorney, uh, because otherwise uh, you mm -hmm. get stuck. You mean some, you need to study some functors into large categories and, and be very careful about this. So one needs the, I think, the theory of Chorney. There are some papers about Chorney. Yes. About, uh, um, class. Class presentable. Yes, yeah, yeah, but there are many. There are also homotopy, uh, homotopy. Yes. I don't remember, but if one sees the paper of Jordan, it's clear which one are related. Yes, for, for, for what is worth, I tried to talk with Boris about this and he believed it was a good idea. So, as much of an endorsement it might be. <laughs> That's another hint that maybe we were on the right track, but uh, quill and model categories always eluded my, I, I'm not intelligent enough to understand them and to do actual computations with them. Also, uh, what, what was the name you just said? Chorley. Chorney. Chorney, uh, okay. Boris Chorney is okay. uh, in Israel, Haifa, if I remember well. Ivan, do you remember? Okay, okay. I think you are right, but I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah, because I know of a group theorist called Ruth Charney, but that's a different spelling. Maybe I can write the name on the chat. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Oh, yes, perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Boris Charney, okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, do we have any more questions or comments? And, and may I just say this was, uh, I, I hope I'm using the word correctly. Uh, like this was one of the most ambitious talks that I've seen in this series. So yeah, many thanks for that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs> I, well, I don't mean to say ambitious as in the speaker is being optimistic about like, you know, like achieving original no, results. No, it's no. just yeah, like ambitious I, I in scope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I, it is a compliment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I did, it. I did, absolutely. 
and i'm very glad that i uh, like after initially forgetting to start recording i did start recording and i'm like really happy that i did that because <laughs> anyway okay um yes, do, do we you. have any more yeah sorry you were saying something no no thanks again yeah no no, no problem <laughs> uh do we have any more questions for osfo any any questions or comments okay okay then let's uh, okay. let's thank fosco again for this uh, really wonderful presentation and yeah let's give him another round of applause thanks can i ask dag if he liked the talk yeah dog i liked it very much yeah. yes i liked it very much yeah great talk fantastic now i feel so accomplished thank you <laughs> <laughs> i'm not well, ironic at all i am extremely happy that you like this idea because yeah i like this very much yeah <clears throat> well this has been quite a great evening for you like first you knew where jim morrison was buried and now doug liked your talk incredible yeah, yeah i yeah. like it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a double double whammy <laughs> Okay. And we're two okay. badges. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Yeah. I'm so, going to stop. Right. Again. I'm going to stop Thanks recording now.